Hi everyone, it is my great honor to uh, be bestowed this opportunity to introduce a woman who truly needs no introduction. Uh, Mary Ellen Copeland has shared her gifts, her vision, and her work with the world, and it has touched so many lives. It has touched my life and open opportunities for me that I never could have imagined. I, I want to share just initially a couple of, uh, of big recognitions that the world recognizes the gift of Mary Ellen's work. She was awarded the uh, U.S. Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association's John Beard Award for outstanding contributions to the field of psychosocial rehabilitation in 2006. She received the SAMHSA Lifetime Achievement Voice Award in 2009. So it is well known and well established that Mary Ellen Copeland has done work that has changed our world. And we are so deeply grateful. We are so deeply grateful. I, I want to say just a few more short things. She has shared her gifts with grace and gentleness. She's shared her gifts and her vision from the authority of personal experience and the experience of her peers. She has ignited the recovery world with the five key recovery concepts, reminding us that there is always hope that personal responsibility is something we can take on, even if it's introduced gently and persistently that we can learn things always and have more knowledge and power, that we can speak up for ourselves, and that support is something that we deserve and that we can create. I'm always inspired when I see Mary Ellen and Ed by the, just the loving demonstration of what it means to have a partner who fully supports you and stands with you. So I just want to acknowledge that Ed is here and Mary Ellen and Ed you, you have rocked my world, and I know that you've done that for so many others. Your, the values and ethics of rap set the gold standard for how we behave, how we treat one another in peer support and mental health recovery programs, but truly for all of humanity and for a society of inclusion and connection, Mary Ellen has pointed the way, and we just say thank you for being here with us today, Mary Ellen. Those, the, the, the PowerPoints, I, I, I go to a lot of conferences where they have PowerPoints and you're supposed to read everything on them and you're supposed to follow along. There's lots of facts and figures. These are really just placeholders that I think are a little more entertaining than looking at me the whole time. So don't worry about the words on them. Um, but they're, they're just some interesting pictures and things. Uh, so I'm really glad to be here. I am absolutely delighted um, to be here. In California, um, it's a lot colder where I come from, and uh, it's, it's really nice to be here. I want to acknowledge Sally Zinman, who's here. Who's, right. I keep going to <laughs> Sally. People that have been doing this for a long, long time. We keep doing it. We have to. And Jay Mahler, who's been doing this work for us. So I want to begin by congratulating peers. Um, I think that um, this is an amazing organization. Uh, you have accomplished a great, great deal. That you're operated by people with a lived experience, that's amazing. Uh, it's incredible to me that you have served over 11,500 people, that you've taught that many people rap. That's amazing, that's wonderful. Uh, you've focused on the five key concepts. You've done all this work with fidelity. Um, you haven't tried to change it around. I'm going to tell you later on about how this was developed. I get credited with the development of it a lot, and I need to. I want to set it straight with you. I want you to know where this came from, and I want to know, tell you why it's important that you stick to that fidelity. It did not come just out of my head, and it didn't come from some. Um, psychologist or psychiatrist or from some major university, I want to tell you where it came from. 
And that's why I appreciate so much the fidelity that Piers has adhered to in doing this work. Um, and I'm thrilled that you're hosting the conference. Um, and as I was thinking about this last night and I was reading through the annual report, I was, you know, I, I, I don't travel as much as I used to, but um, I've been all around the country doing this work and I hear from lots and lots and lots of people and I hear of their frustrations, the problems that they have. I hear of, of some indignities that people experience in the mental health system that are extremely upsetting. And I wish that we had organizations like this everywhere all over the country. I wish we had a peers in every community. That would be my hope, that we have this kind of help and support available for everyone. So congratulations to peers for being I want to mention the 10 by 10 campaign. Um, the goal of the 10 by 10 campaign is to lower the mortality rate of people with mental health issues by 10 years in 10 years. It's really tragic to me that people who receive mental health treatment, they go to the, into the system and they go for the purpose of getting help to relieve mental health problems. And now we're finding that because of the treatment they receive and because they perhaps are not given information about health, that they're dying 10 years earlier than people in the general population. That's not okay. That's not okay. And I've, I've been involved with SAMHSA um, in, in this, this 10 by 10 campaign. I want to see it go forward, I want to see it flourish, um, and I'm glad that, that RAP is part of it. Um, I feel like RAP is the right tool. It's the piece that we can take out to people, that it's a whole health piece, and I'll, I'll tell you the reasons why. For one thing, everybody always wants to know, is it evidence-based? RAP is evidence-based. We have more research now on RAP than they have on most of the medications that they're putting out. We have lots of research. That was not an easy thing. I started early trying to get um, funding for research for some of my very uh, early work and I was, I was got all kinds of negative feedback. They didn't want to give to, to somebody who was just a, a patient. Um, that, that, that they, there was one, one psychiatrist that was on a team that reviewed a proposal that I put in for research, said that people who have mental health issues know, can know no more about taking care of themselves than people with heart disease. What a silly thing to say. Anyway. Now we, we know how wrong that was, but it was very hard, very frustrating. I spent a lot of time trying to get somebody to study it because they wouldn't believe it. I was hearing from people how much this was working, but people would not believe it. Finally, uh, Judith Cook at the University of Illinois at Chicago undertook a major study of it in Ohio, and that led to, and then there were other studies going on, there were studies going on in Minnesota, studies going on in Vermont, studies going on in Kansas, studies going on in Scotland, studies in New Zealand, and now we have lots and lots of research. So now we're listed on the National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices, which is a huge deal to get on there. But, and, and there was some part of me that said, I don't know that I really want to be on there. On the other hand, I want this to be available to everybody. And if it's going to be available to everybody, we have to be listed there. And it took five long years for us to work with them at the federal level to get listed. But, so that's one reason that we're the right tool. We have the evidence that shows that it works. We know that it gives people hope. When I first began um, looking for help for myself, I was told that I should not expect to get better, that I was manic depressive like my mother, and that I would get worse over time. And I don't know why I believed that, because my mother didn't. But um, anyway, there was no hope given to me. They just said, here's a magic pill. You take this and you'll be sort of OK. 
Um, RAP is the right tool because it builds self-agency. Self-agency is a word that, that just, just uh, I just heard used in reference to RAP. Um, Ed and I were trying to get away, and we figured the only place on the earth that we could get away and not have email and not have to think about anything about this and just really clear our minds so we could be fresh for all of this work that we had coming up. We decided we'd take a trip to the Amazon. And so we're on a little boat in the Amazon. There's only 17 other people on this boat. And we're sitting down to have a meal with what looked like a lovely couple. And uh, I, he introduced himself. And he said, you're Mary Ellen Copeland? And I said, yeah. He said, I'm a psychiatrist in Illinois. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, he turned out to be an amazing man. He's been doing this work for a long time. And when he, um, and so he said, we've got rap groups going on all over Illinois. And, and he wrote this paper. Um, actually, we were just in, in Illinois. And I, we became so fond of them, we spent a couple of days with them. And he gave me some papers that he's written. This is a paper on multiple traumas of childhood. And, and he, 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 just, he took the time to really review all of the rap material. And he is really promoting it now. So it's really wonderful. We've had lots of psychiatrists who've been promoting it. He is. Um, and he used that word. It gives people self-agency. He said, we need programs that give people self-agency. Saying, he's saying, you know, nothing else really works. We can't count on anything else to work. We need RAP because it gives people self-agency. It's a, he's, he's, um, he said it gives the person a sense of agency over what's happening with them. Arguably, this is exactly what chronically abused kids did not develop as they grew up. So the RAP program may be especially valuable for multiple traumas of childhood. It's, it, so it was, it was amazing. It was kind of a, a gift. We didn't mean to, to do this on this trip in the Amazon, but to meet Ken Gilbert, to meet a psychiatrist who so strongly supports what we're doing was really great. And to that term, I think, self-agency is a good one. We all need self-agency. It can be easily and safely used to address all health issues and needs. It can be used to address everything. And people used to talk about, well, maybe I should have a wrap for my diabetes and a wrap for my depression and a wrap for my arthritis. And, and, and I've come over time to see, we just need, we are just one whole person. Everything affects everything else. So one wrap that covers the whole thing and it covers all of our health. And that's how I use mine. There's no way I can separate you know, the, the pain that I have in my legs sometimes from the kind of sadness and discouragement I'm feeling with living and some of the other things that I experience, my inability to sleep and those kinds of things. We need something that, that um, is, is just one thing. It can get too confusing. It inter RAP integrates all the treatment options and choices. Well, everything can be all put together in one place. Um, it's self-determined and it's totally voluntary. Nobody should be made to do rap. If somebody is made to do rap, it's not rap. It doesn't work. It's got to be voluntary. That's what this is about. It's got to be voluntary. It focuses on strengths. None of this deficit-based stuff is awful. How many of you had a lot of testing where they told you everything? When I was in the hospital, they did tests on me, told me everything that was wrong with my personality. Who were they to be telling me what was wrong with my personality? <laughs> I went in there because I was having a horrible time with deep depression, and I came out of there much more depressed than when I went in. Um, so we need to focus on strengths need to understand that there's nobody, there's not anybody in the world who can tell us what the limits are of our recovery. You know, they, they told me that my adult children were going to have to take care of me for the rest of my life. I'm still on the books 
Um, for um, you know, social security disability, you can't ever get off of that for some reason. They don't have a mechanism for that. So I'm still on the books as permanently disabled. Um, and they, that's, um, there are no limits to what we can do. There's no limits. We can figure out for ourselves what we want to do, and that's what we need. So there's no limits. And in RAP, the individual, you, the person who's developing the RAP, are the expert on yourself. There is nobody who knows as much about you as you do, right? right. Who else knows more about you? You just can't be. Matthew spoke about it. It's, it's, that's the way it is. So RAP addresses the whole person, the emotional, the physical, and the spiritual. All of them. The whole thing. Aren't they pretty? Yeah. That's my daughter-in-law and the woman who gave her daughter a kidney transplant. Very special people, those two. So I want to tell you how this work all began because, and the reason I want you, I want you to understand the history of it. I want you to understand that the history is really very, very different than other kinds of programs that have come up through, through universities and hospitals. This is a very different kind of program. It began um, probably for me when I was eight years old and my mother started spending all day every day sitting in a rocking chair rocking and crying. And then they took her off and left, took her off to the state hospital thinking that was the right thing to do. They took her off to the state hospital and for eight years, five kids didn't have any parents. We had a dad who was off working all the time. We didn't have a mom. We didn't have a mom for eight years. And because of the treatment that they gave her, she can never remember the time prior to that. She never remembers the time when we were growing up. She has no memory of that. So that's the kind of thing that stayed with me. I always thought, when I was growing up, we went to visit my mother every week. Every Saturday morning we went to that big state hospital and we visited my mother and um, I always thought that if I could just say the right thing, she'd be okay. And I could never figure out what that was. And if, if, I, if, if I was there now and I knew what I know now, I would have just said, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Keep talking and talking and talking and talking. And actually it was talking and talking and talking and somebody that listened and listened and listened. They got her out of that place. They told us she was incurably insane. They had moved her to the back ward. And then a nurse took an interest in her. This is Hoffman. And a volunteer took an interest and they said, come on, Kate, keep talking. And she wasn't used to it because she was a Pennsylvania Dutch lady and she, and we're not supposed to talk a lot. And they kept saying, keep talking. And she talked and talked and talked and talked. And I think if somebody had said that before she went in there, she never would have gone there. But she talked and talked and talked. And then she started thinking and she said, maybe if I get some other people together and they start talking, some people, everybody will start getting better around here. And uh, they discharged her because they didn't want her there anymore. <laughs> so, that's, so she went on, she was 45 then, and she went on to get a, to, everything she did was hard. It was hard because she was a dietitian, but she had the education and they wouldn't let her in the National Dietetics Association because she had been a patient in a mental hospital. Finally, she got a job in an inner city school where nobody else wanted to work. And she was extraordinarily successful. And she was extraordinarily successful in bringing her family back together and in becoming a vital part of the community. And I want you to know that story because I, I want, you know, sometimes you feel like you're just kind of on the edge of things, you're living on the edge of the community and my mother found her way back in that when she died 
there were so many people at her memorial service that they were outside. They was in a big church and they had to be outside. There were so, so many people came. And so many people had such deep sadness. Um, I still, still have sadness and it's been 18 years. So you would have thought that with my mother having gone through that, that I would have learned something, but I didn't learn as much as I did until I started talking to her later. So when I was um, in my 30s, I started having heavy duty bouts of deep, deep depression. Deep depression. And I couldn't get on top of it. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. And so I went to a doctor. And the doctor said, you're manic depressive like your mother. Take this pill and you'll be fine. So I did. And I was sort of fine. But I didn't learn anything. And when I had an allergic reaction to that pill, everything went out of control. I, what, what I'm finding now, I've been doing a lot of reading and um, that, you know, when I stopped taking that pill, I had ex extremes of mood, extreme mania, deep depression, much worse than I had ever had before. And what I'm hearing is that that's kind of what happens. We need to be careful of what we're putting in our bodies. So it may not have been, who, kn who knows why that was, but my mood went wildly out of control. That's when they told my kids, you're going to have to take care of it for the rest of my life. I said, wait a minute, I don't think I want to go there. And so I said, I need to talk to some people and figure out how they deal with this kind of thing. And I had, and, and I had a wonderful vocational rehabilitation counselor. And most people, when somebody comes in and they've got have, have repeated hospitalizations and and they come into their vocational rehabilitation counselor with a grandiose scheme that they're going to do this research and they're going to find out how people, other people with these kinds of problems cope on a day-to-day -day basis. Mostly you get laughed out of the place. But I had a wonderful vocational rehabilitation counselor and she said, what a great idea. I'll help you with it. And we got a social security pass plan and we were off and running. And I developed what I now know are very primitive surveys, old computer, and pull that stuff together. And one of the first people that I interviewed was Catherine Copeland, who's my mother. And key thing that I learned from her was listen, listen, listen. And um, so I started finding people to listen and listen and listen. It's huge. Listen, listen, listen. It's really, really huge. So, so I started doing these intensive studies. I developed these booklets and I wrote out to people and people criticized me and said, you can't have something like that. You've got to have numbers beside it say, this is what everybody wants, five, four, three, two, one, that kind of thing. I said, no, I can't. I don't even know. I don't know enough. I just had open-ended questions. So people answered me by writing on the front and the back and down the sides, all over. Then I ended up with these huge stacks. Here's this person, my moves aren't so stable, and I've got these huge stacks of stuff in my living room, and I start inputting it in my computer, and I start getting answers, and I found answers for myself. So I said to my doctor, I think I should write a book on this. And he said, you're being grandiose. Yeah. <laughs> So then I said to him another time, I said, I'm going to give a workshop. I'm going to give a workshop. And he said, there's no way you could ever give a workshop. I did. I gave a workshop in my town. Forty people came in my little town. And then I went to the, a convention, and people started asking me to give workshops. And that was how it all began. That was how it all began. Um, and out of that early works, out of that very early work came these key concepts. These key concepts did not come out of my mind. They came when I looked at all of those stacks and stacks of um, surveys that were on the floor in my living room by my computer. And when I boiled it down, these are the things that people said. 
They said, we, we have to have hope. We have to be given back personal responsibility. We have to, it's up to us. We have to be able to educate ourselves. We have to be able to advocate for ourselves and we need support. And these are the key concepts. These are the key concepts. And I keep checking that out with people and checking out with what I find and they have stood the test of time. That's what they are, the key concepts. And that's where they came from. They didn't come from my head. I didn't sit down and think, everybody needs this. They came from all of those people. And um, sometimes I think about, I, I wish I could get together with some of them again. Many of them, it's a long time ago. That was in the late 80s. So, so, so I started giving workshops and lectures and training all over, and things were really going very nicely for me. I was trying to convince the Social um, Security Disability Department that I no longer needed their disability checks. They kept sending me checks, and I couldn't seem to convince them not to send me checks. Very weird. Uh, so, so things were going along. I had I published one book and another book and was having lots and lots of workshops. And I was doing a workshop in a, a series of eight workshops in northern Vermont. And it was winter. And this I, was not a mild winter. There was deep snow. And when I put my hand like this, that's what I mean. It was that deep. And the snow was blowing and it was cold and I thought this is silly I was had to drive two hours to get there and I said nobody is going to come they said that for eight weeks in the middle of a Vermont winter if you think about what you think Alaska looks like in the winter that's what northern Vermont looks like in the winter bad news eight weeks we met and we talked about wellness strategies and they came they came every time there were times when I said we should be postponing you should be canceling. And they came anyway. They came a room full of people who were desperate for answers. People who were experiencing really serious mental health issues and challenges. And I thought I had done a pretty good job. So at the end, this woman, Jessie Parker, stood up and she said, you know, this is all well and good but I wouldn't have any idea how to organize this into my life. And I said, whoa, I think we have some work to do. I think we need to figure this out. And everybody agreed with me. And they agreed, and it was still winter, to come back. They came back again three more times. And together with that group of 30 people, that's where rap came from. It did not come from me did not come from me, it came from all of us working together to figure out what we needed. And in that process they said, we need a wellness toolbox, we need a list of things, of all of the resources we have, we need to write those all down. We need, to, what are the, all of our resources? Is it, is it praying? Is it walking around the block? Is it petting the dog? Is it working on a quilt? Is it drawing a picture? Is it listening to music? Is it going to the movies? You know, was it having macaroni and cheese for lunch? What is it? And to list all of those things. And then they said, we need this daily maintenance plan section. We need a list of things that we need to do every single day. Every single day. And if you think about it, think about it. If you did certain things every single day, and I'm sure lots of you are following a daily maintenance plan, and they said, that's, that's what we need. We need a list of things to do every day, and there's certain things I have to do every day, and if I don't, I get in trouble. And before that, they said, you need a list of things, of, of words that describe what we're like when we're well, and we need a list of things we might need to do, and if we didn't do them, it would cause stress. I think, I think you, you guys all know this, but it was a process that we went through. We hammered this out. Literally, sitting around tables. This was not in a hall like this. 
Do you know what, I don't know if any of you all have ever been to, to northern Vermont, we have a lot of old grange halls and old church halls and they're really drafty and the floors are old wood and there's old creaky tables and, and drafts are blowing through. That's where this happened. It wasn't a big fancy place. And then they said we have to identify our triggers. What upsets us and we have to develop a plan. What are our early warning signs that things are getting out of kilter and we need a plan? What are the signs that things are breaking down? And this was a big one and we talked about it a lot. What are the signs that things are breaking down and people are saying, well, if I'm like that, that's when I need to go to the crisis services. And if I go to the crisis services and they put me in the hospital for a few days and I don't want to go there anymore, and I, I think I could figure this out and I think I could help myself. This was a revelation for people. People were saying, you know, we really get into situations where we are really having an awful time. And yet, I bet, using those wellness tools, we could figure out a plan so that we could get out of this mess before we have to reach out so that somebody else is taking over control of our lives, maybe doing to us things we don't want done, treating us in ways that we don't want to be treated, doing things to us that are not helpful. This was a very important section. And we talked about it for a long, long time. I hope that when you're doing this in your rap rooms, you talk about this for a long time. It's an important thing. And the more I hear about what happens when people get into mental health facilities, we need to do everything we can to take care of ourselves and keep ourselves out of facilities. We need to keep ourselves home. That's where I heal. That's where I recover, in my house, in my home. And that's where you, I, I doubt all of you, heal best there. Or maybe you can think of another place where you feel better. But I never feel better in a mental health facility. And then they said, but there are times, there may be times, when things really get out of control. And that almost happened to me a little while ago. Um, I, I came so close. Came so close. Um, but it was a bad time. Over the course of two weeks, I got the news that three of my dear grandchildren had a horrible, horrible disease, and that they were all going to need kidney transplants, and that they would be becoming blind as they went into adulthood. And I was crushed. I was crushed, and I still am. Um, but it was, Ed remembers how I, I was in the, in the, uh, in the operating room awaiting my grandson is having a kidney transplant and everything is going wrong, and I'm knitting and knitting and knitting and knitting, and then really fast, and then one of the nurses grabbed me and says, come on, we're going for a walk, and she's walking me around the property. We got through, we got through. And I still got through so that we can still be there for these kids. My grandson Samuel's going on a make-a-wish trip to um, Italy at the end of the month. And we can be the support team. So, so we've been a support team through the whole thing. And with that, I, but that could have sent me over. And it could have sent me into the place where I needed a crisis plan. And this crisis plan has some of the boilerplate that you need in crisis plans. But it has some things that they don't usually include. And when I first put this out, I got some feedback from some um, healthcare facilities, and they said, it's too long, you have to have it all on one page. And I said, this can't go on one page. People need to know a lot. They need to know a lot. They're not willing to read a few pages then they shouldn't be helping us. They need to, we need to have a lot of information. And so it needs to start with a listing. A listing of what, when do we need them to take over so that other people can see it. This is a piece that we give to other people. What are those things? How's anybody else going to know that we're having a bad time? So it has that piece. What are the signs? Like if I'm pacing and pacing and pacing, and I've been pacing for hours and hours and hours, and I'm really hurting myself, 
somebody needs to step in. I can't stop. Or if I'm washing my face and washing it, and it's bloody, and I've been washing it for hours and hours, somebody needs to step in. Or if I think that I'm someone that I'm clearly not, if I think that I'm President Obama, somebody needs to step in. I don't even look like President Obama. <laughs> So, so, to, so to list those things. So that was one important thing. And then to list the supporters that we want to step in. So that not just anybody can step in, but just the people we want to. And then one very, very, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. A very important piece, and I think it, it gets overlooked a lot, that's part of this crisis plan, is the, the it's about a um, community home respite care plan, and that's a plan that you all need to have. Everybody needs one. A plan so that if you got into a very difficult time, a crisis, that you could, your supporters could swoop in and they could stay with you and keep you safe and do for you the things that would help and not do the things that wouldn't help and you could stay at your house or maybe do something in the community. A special, special plan that takes a lot of doing. A crisis plan is a lot of work and um, you, you want to list all the things that help you and all the things that don't help. And that's why I think it, it's really good if you can develop the rest of your wrap first because it gives you lots of ideas and, and helps you so that you can do this crisis planning piece. But it's an important piece. So that's what they said then that you need. You need to have your wellness tools, you need your daily maintenance plan, your triggers, your early warning signs when things are breaking down, your crisis plan. And then a few couple years later, somebody said, you know, it's not quite finished. You need a, a piece that's going to take you from that crisis around, back around to using your daily maintenance plan. What are you going to do in the meantime there? So we worked out a series of questions that would that tested on a whole bunch of people, and people fed me all kinds of feedback, and, and that's that's rap post crisis plan. That's the whole thing. That came from those people in northern Vermont. That didn't come from my mind. I'm not that smart. <laughs> so I don't think anybody is. I don't think anybody can figure that out. I don't think so. So, what are the expected outcomes that we can see from participating in a RAP group, developing your own RAP, living RAP, attending a RAP support group? We can see increased hopefulness. Increased hopefulness, and everybody that I know of agrees that hopefulness is a very important piece of recovery and wellness for all kinds of, for whole health, for everything about health. Self-knowledge, that in all kinds, no matter what kind of condition we have, we need to know about it. And we have such good ways of finding out about things these days. The internet, when used well, is a fantastic uh, resource for us, um, for self-knowledge. We have increased ability to take positive action in our own behalf. We have that self-agency. We can prevent things. We can prevent very, very, very difficult things from coming up. We learn how to prevent, um, prevent things. We feel better. We get well and we stay well. So, so that's kind of the rap story. And I want to tell you of the Vermont story. And I want to tell you the Vermont story because it reminds us that we need to be ever mindful. That we have done a lot of work now for a lot of years to let people know about recovery and wellness and rap. We've done a lot of, lot of work. Back in the 1940s, there was a, a doctor in Vermont. His name was Eldon Brooks. Right. And he and a few other people there at the Vermont State Hospital, there were thousands of patients there in those days, and um, 
he decided that, that he could get these patients well recovered. These were patients, you know, in those days they just talk about people getting well. These, that he could get these patients recovered if he taught them skills, if he listened to them, if they had some groups, if everybody in the facility was, a, was, was part of the process, the people who swept the floor, and the people who did the cooking, and the people who worked in the gardens, if everybody was involved in help assisting and supporting people through their wellness. He developed a whole psychosocial rehabilitation plan back then. And he used it with people. And he had a system, and they gradually, gradually left the hospital. And over time, thousands of people went out. Then, in the 1970s, something happened, probably funds were cut or something, and the program was stopped. And 30 years later, 30 years later, Courtney Harding did some research to find these people. What happened to these people? They're probably either all dead or they're in some other institution or something. So she went out and took a look. And they had families, and they had jobs, and they were living their lives. They were doing the things they wanted to do, being the kind of people they wanted to be. But that program doesn't exist anymore. And we have to be very, very careful when we come up with good things. We have to be ever mindful that things can change. Funding can change. People's focus can change. And we have to be ever mindful to not let that happen again. So I want to tell you that rap is everywhere now. We have lots and lots and lots and lots of rap going on in California. Lots of it in California. Yeah. DJ's doing her work. Everybody's doing it. There's a lot of rap in California. Maryland, they have a system of um, peer support centers, and they have spread it all through Maryland. They've done a fantastic job. They have a, a on our own in Maryland has has all these peer support centers, and people have access, easy access to rap and it's spread all through Maryland. Um, West Virginia is one of the early adapters of RAP and continues to work with RAP. They have recently started a program for kids. Um, I think kids are re really reaching out to kids. Um, my psychiatrist friend that we met in the Amazon um, really feels strongly that this is an important tool to use for kids, that kids need to learn self-agency, and we're seeing it ourselves right now. We have a grandson who has a lot of difficulties in school and at home, and uh, he's, he's nine years old. So Ed's been working with him on a, on a wellness recovery action plan. And now he's going to school and, and he's, he's negotiating. He's negotiating where he sits in the classroom. He's negotiating how much time he has to sit still. He's negotiating so he can say to the teacher, I'm really bored now, and I'm afraid I'm going to get into trouble, so I need to go walk the halls for a while. So, so, so that's what we need to be teaching our kids. He, he, he knows that he has a hard time at home in the summer because he's an only child and his parents are really busy. And so he has taken the time to look all through the newspapers, check out all the summer camps, then he called me up and he had a whole list. These are the camps I want to go to. <laughs> so I called his mother and talked her into it. I said, these are the camps Stuart wants to go to. And we got him all signed up and registered. He's got his summer all planned for it. So, so, he's, this is, so we need to give kids self-agency. Self-agency. And West Virginia is doing a great job of that. I want to mention Washington, D.C. Yvonne Smith, some of you probably know, has been looking like mad. She called me, and I remember the day she called me, this woman called me from Washington. She's going on and on and on on the phone, and she said, you have to let me come to a training, and I can't pay you anything. I said, yeah, it costs us a lot of money to do this work. We've got to have some help with it. She says, I can't pay you anything. I can get there on the train. I'm coming. <laughs> and she did. 
And she has been working like a trooper now for probably 15 years. Amazing. She is, if, if the town, if, if the city won't fund it, she does it anyway. She has open groups where anybody can show up. She's taken our little MyRap things. Where did Ed go? Ed? A MyRap. He's taken these little MyRap things that we developed, and, and we have one. Oh, okay. We have one of these for each of you. Um, these are called MyRap. And she's working with people on the, she's sitting on the curb and working with a MyRap with people that are homeless. Because they've got this little thing, they can stick it in their pocket, you know. And we've got this, we've got these in, uh, we've got, you all get, you all get one of these, and then we, we try to make them available as wide as I can. But there's Yvonne down in Washington. We'll send her as many as she can pass out on the curb, sitting down there, doing her rap. She's incredible. We have lots and lots of Matthew. Um, part of lots and lots of, of rap work going on across the state of Pennsylvania. It's really um, in integrated into the whole mental health system in Pennsylvania. We have, I could go on and on and list other states. We're thrilled with the, the rap work that's going on in Japan and the Netherlands and New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Hong Kong. Where were you? You went to someplace, DJ. You were just in New Zealand. So, so rap is everywhere. Um, one of the things about rap that makes it really useful is that you can adapt it for almost anything. Anybody, your rap is your own. There's no strict rules. You make it the way you want it to be. And uh, I'm going to well you can see the pictures. One of those is of a woman who's done a scrapbook, but the other one is this woman who has made, she's done a, a rap scrapbook, but the other one is a woman who, if you've been following my Facebook, she, if, if you've seen this quilt, she has made a quilt. Each page of her rap is a quilt, and those are pieces of her quilt. So you can take rap and you can adapt it and make it something that's interesting and fun for you. We need to be moved, getting rap out into the community and we all need to think about, we need to be getting it into primary care. It really needs to be gotten into primary care. And I wanted to check with you guys about um, my friend, the psychiatrist I met in the Amazon, said that he thought we should develop these prescription-like pads that the doctor could have on their desk, and then there'd be a space that says, wrap across, you are prescribed to go to the wrap group, and that there'd be a place on them so, that, so the doctor can just rip it off and there's a place to put in the time and the place. And, and uh, so if that's something that would be useful to you, we can just kind of pull it together and then you could get them from us, if you think that would be a useful thing. Yes. Yes? Okay. Presentations in the community will help get wrap out. Visiting with healthcare providers, go in, talk to them, tell them about it. If you're, if you're using a wrap, you can do this at every level. If you're using a wrap, tell your doctors, tell your care providers, tell everybody about it, tell them about the usefulness of it. Um, if you're a wrap facilitator, you can talk to them about that. Um, if you're um, a program administrator, spread the word. Newspaper articles can help a whole lot. Community TV, we're going to have some community TV options here. We use community TV. Um, I've been on our community TV station locally. We're going to have, I guess I'm going to be on community TV here. So. And bulletin boards, you can set up bulletin boards of agencies and organizations. So there's all kinds of ways. All kinds of ways. So I'm going to be, finish up. Um, and then I want to hear from you, but I have a couple things I want to say before I finish up. Um, that one of the values of RAP is dignity, compassion, and respect for all. And I continue to hear heart-rending stories. Um, heart-rending stories. And we all, and I think RAP is, flies in the face of the elimination of the use of seclusion, restraints, strip searches, 
and other traumatizing and invasive procedures. My friend, the psychiatrist, told me that he sometimes has to send people to hospitals, but he doesn't like to, because in order to get, they have to have a diagnosis, and Medicaid won't accept a diagnosis unless they've been hospitalized several times. But he said, if I send them to the hospital, they strip search them, and then when they went in, they didn't have post-traumatic stress disorder, but when they come out, they do. And he says, my hands are tied. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So I heard stories here that people go into a facility, and for two weeks, they have to wear a hospital gown instead of their own clothes. Yes. That's happening here? Why? Why should anybody have to wear a hospital gown for two weeks when they're not having any medical procedures? So we have to work on that. And we have to make sure that everything we do is informed. For back 10, 15 years ago, we were told that we all had broken brains, that something was really, really wrong with our brain. They've been trying to prove that and they've never proved it. They've never proved it. Instead, the body of knowledge that's coming along is that what we experience is from the bad things that have happened to us. And that we need to be treated as if bad things have happened to us. And ask what's happened to you instead of what's wrong with you. And then be treated with dignity, compassion, and respect as we figure out what we can do. And RAP is a really, really good way to proceed with that. But, so, what I want to do is ask, well, before, <laughs> um, I, I want to tell you, I want to tell you a story before I finish up and open it up to you to ask questions. Um, I want to take, take you back to that winter in Vermont where RAP was developed, and I want to tell you about a man that was there, and his name was David. And David wore very, very dark gray, somber looking clothes and had a hat pulled down over his face. He could only come with a care provider. He couldn't speak in words that you could understand. And every few minutes, he would have to go outside and pull himself together, and then he would come back in. And he came to every session. And he came as we were working on rap. He was, he was there. He was a listener who didn't have the ability to participate. Then I, after, so after it was over, I'd get a call, and the call would say, David wants to go to another rap group. Where's there another rap group? So I would tell them, and I kept getting these calls. David wants to go to another rap group. And so over the years, I got a number of calls about David going to a rap group. And then one day, I hadn't heard anything about David in quite some time, and I was invited to a, a a rap group graduation, and when they're close enough so I can go, I'd like to go, um, because it's really nice to see. It's nice to hear people's stories and see how they've come. And so I went to one in Springfield, Vermont, and I was greeted by a man at the door. He said, hi, Mary Ellen, and he was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and shorts. <laughs> and it was summer, anyway, it wasn't winter. And, uh, and, and, he, and I looked at him, and I looked at him, and he said, you don't know who I am, do you? And I, I caught my breath, and tears came to my eyes. Because that was David. He was finishing up another rap group. And look how far he had come. He was not with a care provider. He had gotten there himself. And he was moving on with his life. Yay! So, so there And I think the, you, the keys to enhancing RAP are, so many of you know so much about RAP that I wanted to talk about taking it a step further. And the keys to that are creativity and sharing ideas. And all of the information that I share with you comes from what I gather from people. This is the stuff that I gather all the time. I mean, like, one thing that just has come to mind, different things come come up over time. And one of the things that I've learned lately from emails from a variety of people 
is that they're saying that on their when things are breaking down list, where they often said, well, that's when I would give away my car keys and my credit card, and I give away my medications, have somebody else manage them. They've got a new one on there. They say, give away my computer. Have somebody keep my computer so that I can't be sending out nasty emails to people or doing something with my computer in case I got into a crisis. So that's how I get information, and that's how we add to this body of work. I need all of I, um, that's how we build this body of work. So please, it says info at mentalhealthrecovery.com, right on the bottom of the, the green or the orange little my wrapper crisis plan that you got, send that to me. I may not be able to get right back to you, but we are hearing what you're saying, and as we get information, we keep adding it to the body of knowledge, so it's all of us growing this together. So the, one of the big things with RAP, and I was just talking to somebody about it in the hall, is that you can choose how you have it. There's a build your own RAP program online that you can use that I found to be very useful to me. I can change it easily. I can send my RAP to myself. I can send it to my counselor if I decide I want to do that. But I'm in there all the time and I'm changing it all the time. And build your own RAP works nicely for me. There's a special version on there for um, of veterans and people in the military. Um, uh, it's, um, I think it costs $10. We can do it through a company and you pay $10 or something. Um, lots of people use this for reading binder. There's other kinds of notebooks, small notebooks. There's a computer software program that we have. Um, we have forms in a lot of the books. Almost all of the books we have now have wrap forms in them. Um, we've seen people do a wrap poster. Um, I told you before about the woman who's done a wrap, quilted wrap book. One of the things that we're working on and we hope to have soon is a wrap app. And, uh, yeah, you like that idea? I'll tell you what the problem with the wrap app has been. We've, we, this is not a federally funded or heavily funded operation. So we reached out to people to say, how about building us a wrap app? And they want twenty, thirty thousand dollars to do that. We don't have that kind of money. We're not that. So, but anyway, some opportunities seem to be coming along, and we think we're going to be able to get that work done. But it's taken a long time to figure it out. We also have the MyRap now and the MyRap Crisis Plan. That you, all, you all, I hope, have copies of those now. Okay. Um, and where you keep it is really kind of important. Do you keep it on your computer, on your phone, by your bedside, on a table, on the wall, in the refrigerator, in your pocket? There's all kinds of places that you can keep your wrap. There's, and so there's lots of adaptability to wrap. And one of the things that I think that, I, I just want to spend a couple minutes on this and then I want to get into some wrap group stuff. I think that the wellness toolbox is incredibly important. I've heard of many people who all they have done is the wellness toolbox. And that's been huge for them. Just that, that it's just that idea that here are all these things that I can use to help myself get better. And when I'm having a rough time, I've got a whole list. And I go to that list myself when I just, just want to figure out what to do for the day that would be really special for myself. And I look down that list and there's all kinds of ideas. It's great on a day when things are not going so well and you can't quite figure out what to do. You've got loads and loads of options. So I think having a strong wellness toolbox is imperative. Then I hope you develop the rest of the plan, but some people just don't get to it, and this is huge. So you have to think about it every day. You have to think of it as a way of life. Um, it represented for me a huge change in how I thought about myself. I used to think if, if I started to feel, you know, like I had that deep, cold feeling in, right here in my chest and um, like I didn't want to get out of bed and like I didn't want to see anybody and like the whole world was awful and everybody was out to get me and wasn't sure I wanted to be alive. 
I used to think, well, I'm getting worse and worse, and I'm not going to be able to go to that wedding I wanted to go to, and you know, I'll never have a partner, and uh, I'm not going to be able to take that college course that I wanted to take, and probably going to lose this apartment. That's the way I used to look at it. Then I switched it around. Okay, this is how I feel. What am I going to do to bring myself out of this? What am I going to do? What are the wellness tools I'm going to bring, use to pull myself up and up and up until I'm out of this? And that was a whole huge shift in thinking for myself. And, and I think that that's the shift that we have to make for ourselves or help other people make. Um, we are in control. There are things we can do to make our life the way we want it to be. Um, and for me, developing that one strong wellness toolbox is an ongoing process. And um, we keep adding and adding and adding to it. And actually, sometimes you might even want to take some things off of it that you don't feel good about or that don't work for you anymore. But you just, just keep working and working and working on that wellness toolbox. There are ideas everywhere, self-help books, magazines, friends, family members, care providers. Um, there's a wellness tools blog on, the, on our website. Um, and I already said, you want to just, just use this. Just use it and use it and use it. Use your wellness toolbox to build the life that you want for yourself. That's, you should have, every tool should be in there for you to build the life that you want for yourself. So I want to talk for a minute about, I know lots and lots and lots of you are RAP group facilitators. But in, and so what I have to say for you RAP group facilitators, but I want those of you who are not RAP group facilitators, but who are in RAP groups, you have a responsibility to that RAP group as well. So you can say to your RAP group facilitator, I heard this idea, could we try this, could we do it that way? I don't think we're doing this quite right. It's everybody is part of this group, the people who are in the group and the facilitators. It's all of you working together. So these ideas are for everybody. So um, you can really make a rap group more interesting and exciting if you read to the group some vignettes from, there's, we've got the book Rap Stories, and we have wellness and recovery and rap stories all the time on Facebook and on the rap groups, and you can read those stories to your group. They can just be three or four sentence stories. They don't have to be long. Um, you can include some creative arts. You can have um, space in your group so that people can try different things and people may find something they really love to do. They might find they like to work with clay or they might to work with paints or they might um, doing some scrapbooking. Um, you can have tape recorders available so people can tape record parts of their rap that would be handy for them to have on a tape recorder, their, their list of wellness tools. Um, you can have, make it more interesting by having people write ideas on sticky notes and then put them on a, on a, a, a wall, a, on the wall, and then people can, can read each other's ideas that way. Um, you can do some role playing, I think that that's a really, really good piece of role playing. One of the role plays that I would suggest you do is how you would like it to be when you first reach out for help with, for mental health issues. So that you could, one of the ways, one of the things that can happen when you reach out for mental health services is you can go in and say, you know, gee, I'm having a really rough time and I was hoping you could give me some help. I say, okay, sit down. And now first we need to fill out this form and what are your insurance numbers? And um, <laughs> have you had your vaccinations? And, and they go through a long list of rigmarole. And I think the way we want people to do this is to, the first thing that comes in, say, I'm having a really rough time, and they say, gee, what happened? What happened? And then the next question is, what do you need? How can we help? And what are the wellness tools you have? What do you have that you can use to help yourself? So um, you can be role playing those kinds of interactions so that people can see more clearly how to ask for what they want. It's up to us to say, look, we don't like it when we come in and you just want our insurance numbers and you don't seem to really care what's going on with us. We instead want you to know what's going on in our lives, what we're experiencing, 
We want you to help us figure out some simple, safe, non-invasive things that we can do to help ourselves. When I asked for help, first they took that kind of information, then I gave them a little information and they said, here's a pill, and that was the end of it. And some of you probably have the same thing, and we need to make them do more than that. Um, we can make slides. You have lots of slides that you get with your facilitator training manual, but you can make more slides to show to people to add additional information. You can have writing and journaling, text journaling. Um, you can develop whole PowerPoint presentations on, um, on special topics that are of interest to the group. We've also, in the facilitator manual, there's lots of PowerPoint um, presentations that you can choose to use or not. You want to use all the wrap stuff, but then there's lots of other options in there that you can use as well. You might want to have some music in your group. You might want to have posters. People can make posters. People can share things on posters. They can do an activity that's in the, your facilitator manual, um, a, a thinking activity, brainstorming activities. You can show people how to do things. You can have show people how to do peer counseling, how to do focusing. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways. Um, you can do problem-solving activities. Um, you can do relaxation and visualization exercises. You can get presenters in from the community or the good people from the community. Talk about diet, talk about life, talk about exercise, talk about yoga, talk about whatever people in your group would like to hear. Um, you can um, bring people into your group that could share stories um, from uh, about people who've been using RAP for a long time, um, sharing stories. Um, about how it's worked for them. As people in the group and as facilitators, let me look at the time. I, um, I'm going to stop with this slide, but everybody in the group needs to be part of the decision making about the learning space, what it's like where you learn, um, is it accessible, is there plenty of light, all of those kinds of things. Um, you all should have input on it. And, and be sure to give your um, your rapid facilitator um, lots of feedback. Be part of developing a comfort agreement that works for everybody. And then, do everybody that's in a rap group should know that the, the rap group is with a whole values and ethics list, a whole list of 15 values and ethics that are supposed to be part of every RAP group. And somebody wrote me an email not long ago, and they are a RAP group facilitator, and they said, we have been told that we're not to show that list of RAP, of values and ethics to the people who are in the RAP group. Is that correct? And I said, no way. No way. The RAP group facilitator should show the people in the RAP group the list of values and ethics, and then they should check in with the people in the group and say, am I following these values and ethics? And if you don't think I am, how should I change it so that you feel comfortable and safe here and that I'm following the values and ethics? I want, I want you all to be thinking way outside the box. I want you to think way outside the box on your wellness tools and how you're going to live your life. And I wanted to tell you about Bonnie, who um, had been in many, many, many different psychiatric hospitals. And this one time, she decided instead of going to a psychiatric hospital, she was having a really tough time, she was going to go to a respite center. She was doing well in the respite center, and she was being supported by her peers. And um, one day, the director stopped in, and the people who were supporting her were really upset. They said, why are you upset? The director said, why are you upset? And they said, because Bonnie's in the shower with her clothes on. So the director, my friend Sherry, went into the bathroom and she said, Bonnie, can we talk? And Bonnie said, sure. And she said, why are you in the shower with your clothes on? And she said, because I get this horrible, overwhelming, very painful, hot feeling, like I should really cut myself, really hurt myself badly. And the only thing that stops it is to get in the water as quickly as I can. And so I jump in the shower with my clothes on. And Sherry hugged her and said, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. And she said, every time I do it in the hospital, 
um, they put me in restraints or seclusion. So we need to look at why people are doing things and that that's okay. It's okay to get in the shower with your clothes on if that's what works. That's what works. It's okay anyway. Who cares? <laughs> The other one I want, to, I want to just briefly tell you, just to, to keep on going, think, having you thinking outside the box, um, I want to tell you about a man over in England, and he had a lot of problems with really severe hearing voices. He heard a lot of voices coming in. They were loud, they were intrusive, they were really negative, they were nasty, and his first reaction when they start up is to yell at them, and he yells loud, he swears at them, and they get worse when he's in stressful situations. And so whenever he goes out of his group home where he was living, he goes out and the stress picks up. So his voices start and they start yelling at him and he starts yelling back at the voices really loud and then they come and pick him up and they take him off to the hospital for a few days and he was pretty sick of it. So he was at a visit with one of his supporters and the supporter said, I have an idea. Um, got a broken cell phone. The next time you go out, just when those voices come up, when you start yelling at him, put the cell phone up to your ears. So he went out, the voices came up, he started yelling at them, he put the cell phone up to his ears, nobody paid any attention at all. <laughs> so this guy, he said, whoa, I, I've been wanting to take the train into Birmingham. He I mean, into London for a long time. I want to take the train into, into London, to Birmingham. That's a long way. And uh, so he says, I'm going to do it. So he gets on the train, and he's got his cell phone up to his ear, and he's yelling into it, and all the other business types, they've all got their cell phones up to their ear, and they're yelling into it. And uh, they go into the tunnel outside of London, and everybody's cell phone service get cut off. And he keeps yelling into his cell phone. So he gets off the train and some guy comes over to him and says, what kind of service do you have? And says, I <laughs> anyway, I leave you with that. We need to think outside the box. There's lots and lots of answers. There's lots of ways we can get by.